from talking to these people, what kind of, how, how do they sort of come to that point where they go, actually, we need to leave? Mm. They will know my participants well. So he was an army officer, he was in the army, and he, he, he was a brother in a you know, nice middle-class family, quite mm-hmm. comfortably. So basically what he said, you know, when you raised in that environment, you never question your, um, you know, the government. Mm. And then when he was in the army, the, the, the famine started. So he, he watched a lot of soldiers die of hunger. But right. the other thing was, when he, when he was at school, he learned army is the, you know, people who protect you. <laughs> but when he actually joined the army for the first time, so, you know, when you join it, you have all the new things. Mm-hmm. And then he had uh, some presents from his school friends and all that. And it was completely stolen. So his uniform was new. And then when he woke up, it was exchanged into old one. And his new uniforms were stolen by another soldier, a senior soldier. So that was one sort of a starting point. And then the other one was he w- witnessed a lot of uh, stealing and rape. Of the by the soldiers of civilians. So um, he said one one example was the people were taking turns to cook, right in the army, and the senior will come to this chef or cook and say, create seven dishes, and then obviously you need to get ingredients. But what you you get ingredients that has nowhere near you can create seven dishes. So what he's saying is go out and steal from civilians and create seven dishes. That's the order. But obviously he doesn't say that directly. So he was sleeping and his senior woke him up at night. So he said, where are, where are we going? And he said, follow me. So basically they were stealing. So he started completely disillusioned mm-hmm. by these experiences. And then uh, one of his jobs was basically there were a lot of soldiers, because they were so hungry in the army, they started to run away to their homes. So as a single man, he, he was able to kind of travel, because he wasn't tied by families, yeah. all over the countries to bring the soldiers back to the army. So what happened was, during this time, he saw what the country looked like, and it was absolutely dire. So he started to really question... You know, I thought my country was the best in the world. Sure. And it was absolutely rotten, he realized. So he wanted to really see what outside the world is like. Mm. I think that really drove him to do that. And other cases, you know, also North Korea is very um, class-based. Mm-hmm. So there are three different groups. The government is divided. Uh, one is... so. Uh, North Korean class system is Songban. One is the, I forgot the name, but sort of like, a, you know, high ranking, the desirable. Yeah. These are the ones who fought during the, you know, Japanese rule uh, against the Japanese or fought with uh, Kim Il-sung, you mm-hmm. know, the founder of North Korea. Yeah. Um, and, and the one who's still technically uh, yes. in charge. <laughs> and then the, um, the middle is sort of um, in between, but the last... One, those undesirables are the ones who have got families in South Korea or who used to be uh, work for Japanese during Japanese occupation. Mm-hmm. And once you are categorized as undesirable, it, it remains in the family record and that stops the next generation to actually doing things. Mm. So it, it affects their university entrance, you know, their job, everything. Yeah. So these people obviously have a, you know, a not great life because yeah. they are constantly, permanently stigmatized. So I think that kind of things gives this sort of, a, you know, less um, illusion about the, the country. And then obviously with the hunger and everything that forced them to kind of, a, you know, let's live. And then once they also, a lot of them have families in China, mm-hmm. relatives, so they have opportunities moving back and forth. Um, you know, sometimes with the permission. Yeah. Then that gives, you know, how um, China is different. Mm. So that sort of will encourage them to actually, yeah, let's escape. To do it, yeah. 
What about the future? So you you don't see really a future, and in the in the short term at least, mm. where anything's going to change. What what about in North Korea in general? I mean, from people you talk to, I mean, do do you, do they see or did they see any changes for them personally over there? Um. Mm, not immediately, I don't think so. I mean, okay. they do a lot of work to bring that, bring the changes mm-hmm. to North Korea, and so they, one of the things they do is actually, uh, you know, sending out foreign information, mm-hmm. um, so ordinary people can see how other people outside North Korea live. Yeah. Um, but for me, it will it will take a long time to have some real meaningful changes. Uh, take place in North Korea, in my view. Mm-hmm. Is, is there not at all, do you think there's no, absolutely no desire by the ruling class to make life better over there? No, I don't think that's the case. I, I'm sure, I, I don't necessarily think, you know, they, they are deliberately making people miserable. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. It was just the, when it happened was the, the, because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, they used to rely on Soviet Union's help a lot. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, this big helping hand's gone, and then they just mismanaged the whole economy. Mm-hmm. So it kind of collapsed. But I don't really think, you know, that's what they really want. But probably it's just the outcome of mismanagement and trying to, you know, control uh, the whole thing without actually opening up to the world and right. for the sake of their own benefit. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah, yeah. So, but, but I think... In my view, uh, Kim Jong Un is not necessarily because he's beneficial um, leader, mm-hmm. but in order to make sure his position is legitimately held, mm-hmm. I think he will trying to make sure economically the country is viable. Mm-hmm.